to be serene. Oh, and just FYI, this meeting is being recorded. Um, so um, the discussion period will not be just the um, presentations. Go ahead, Shereen. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, <clears throat> so for the, the past five months, we've been organizing, protesting, and, and waging a struggle at an unprecedented level in solidarity with Gaza, uh, demanding an end to the genocide and to Biden's uh, enabling of genocide. And our movement has come uh, really far. Uh, we've pushed through repression and smears to force attention on Israel's assault on Gaza, We've pushed back against a racist narrative and popularized solidarity with Palestine at a mainstream level more than ever before. We've shown that Biden and Pelosi uh, and Democrat and Republican politicians alike can't show up wherever they want without facing disruption. Uh, we've shown the U.S. And, and the world that Biden is actually no as lesser evil, but complicit and, and a partner in, in genocide. And we've shown that even after months, we won't uh, give in and stop mobilizing or, or letting our momentum slow down or fade. And we've kept our numbers up and kept protesting and kept uh, organizing creative civil disobedience actions. Um, but even as we've pushed further and expanded uh, our solidarity movement more than ever before, the genocide has continued in Gaza. Um, after, you know, Ridiculing the idea of a ceasefire for over four months, Biden has now made soft statements about a ceasefire, but without actually applying any pressure on Israel, which could look like threatening to end military aid to Israel, for example. Um, and he's only he's talked about dropping humanitarian aid, but he's only uh, dropped enough aid over Gaza to feed around two percent of the population for for a day, and while also bombing Yemen for its resistance activity, et cetera. So Israel has continued to bomb Gaza now with a new pattern of bombing sites where Gazans are awaiting aid after creating a situation where much of the population is facing starvation. Um, Israel is determined to continue its campaign of extermination and genocide, determined to go as far as it can. And our pressure uh, sadly hasn't managed to force the hand of the US to apply actual pressure that would change the course of events. Um, so while the assault on Gaza continues, uh, which Israel, as I said, is determined will continue for the coming months, our, our first and foremost demand has to still be for a ceasefire. Of course, this is in many ways, as, as uh, activists have talked about, a, a minimal demand, but since Israel and its supporters haven't budged on it, it's, it's still our primary demand. Um, alongside demands like ending US military aid to Israel, an end to the starvation of Gazans, for humane entry of, of aid, and against the forced transfer of the, the remaining Gazan population, which is uh, Israel's desired goal. So, and once the bombing is stopped, we must continue with other demands, like allowing the return of Gazans uh, who have left, for example, and the rebuilding of all of Gaza, entry of material needed to rebuild, a permanent end to the siege and an end to the Israeli occupation and apartheid as a whole and so on. Um, sorry. Within our movement, we've we've managed to maintain momentum, as I said, and, and organizing has strengthened throughout this time, which has to continue in the coming months and years. Um, and in order to create the long-term movement we need, there has to be more emphasis on creating democratic spaces to strategize, to debate, and, and discuss strategies and tactics locally and nationally, and in coalition with various groups brought under larger umbrella coalitions and joint efforts. Wherever we are, I would argue we should be thinking about, you know, how can we bring in as many groups as possible that are working in solidarity with Palestine into a space together, in person, whenever possible, to create stronger organizing networks, coalitions, and campaigns that can last and, and set up set ourselves up organizationally and politically for the long-term struggle that's ahead. So how can we bring together, you know, just to name a few, uh, JVP, SJP, PYM, et cetera, along with local anti-racist organizations, healthcare workers, and both experienced and new activists in our cities, to open up space to discuss perspectives, local targets, and campaigns. Um, and this can help to continue to engage other layers of the community in mass protest and direct actions, 
and to continue to put forward creative ideas for disruptions and civil disobedience and bring together the skills and, and forces needed to put forward local union resolutions and so on. Um, I think that one tactic I've learned uh, that has worked in movements elsewhere is to continue to connect issues to Gaza and Palestine, to continue to make solidarity mainstream and second nature. So one way this is already being done is um, the fact that it's been popularized, that the, the gov US government is making a choice to send military aid to Israel instead of funding health care, housing, and education in this country. So that's connecting, you know, injustices of capitalism here to military spending and imperialist war abroad. Um, the other day I saw a poster that said, you know, it was commenting sarcastically on Biden's latest race, racial slur saying, I am the illegal, but you're funding genocide, etc. And it can also be done, you know, when there's discussions of feminism, queer issues, bringing up how Palestine is a feminist issue and a queer issue, integrating discussions of Gaza and Palestine and U.S. imperialism into every political issue and making those connections between struggles to make to continue making uh, solidarity more automatic and second nature on a broader level. Um, and we must keep pushing against the idea that, you know, the Democrats will save us and continue to remind activists and, and the broader movement uh, that it is through our grassroots organizing and mass movements that will build power in the long run, not through relying on, on democratic politicians. I think Palestine solidarity activists um, have for decades had more insight into the Democrats than, than many others due to the fact that every democratic president throughout history has aided Israel, expanded aid to Israel. We've known that they weren't really progressive. Um, so for example, uh, Obama said nothing during 2008 and nine, you know, <laughs> as the Lupe Fiasco um, quote in his song goes, Gaza Strip was getting bombed, Obama didn't say shit. Um, so Palestine activists have consistently had the right conclusions about, uh, you know, historically about who our enemies are and who our audience is, you know, understanding that the presidency, whoever it is, is not our friend. Um, and also on campuses, experiencing that university administrations continuously try to, to shut us down. They're not our friends. Um, and the way forward is therefore through struggle from below uh, with masses of people in the streets and in coal coalitions with other oppressed groups and other radicals. Um, we shouldn't be swayed by the idea that in the future, because of, you know, the uncommitted votes, et cetera, that in the future, Democrats won't support Israel again, because in reality, their part, their party is uh, tied to U.S. capitalism and imperialism in the Middle East and relies on um, on Israel to maintain a despotic uh, status quo in the region. So neither of the two parties in this country can can save us, only building up our own independent movements. And we should remember the lessons of the Bowman debate of 2021 and 2022, which was in the DSA, um, in which, you know, there was the prioritizing of a politician and politicians that still chose to, to fund Israel, um, prioritizing these politicians instead of the movements calling them out. And that that won't help strengthen our movements. It'll cause thousands of people to turn away, and, and rightly so. See my time. Okay, I think I'm fine. Um, I'll end by saying that you know we need to expand our collective education within our movements with study groups and panels about Palestine, about histories of activism in Palestine and in the U.S., and lessons from what has worked and what has not, um, as well as more analysis and reading about uh, the Middle East region as a whole and about other struggles and their connections to Palestine in the global capitalist system. Our movement has moved forward in leaps and bounds over the past five months. And, you know, we, I think we really have the potential to, to push it forward and continue to build it and make it stronger for the, for the long term. And, and education is a major part of that as well. Um, I'll, I can, you know, discuss more of these threads uh, in the Q and A, but excited to hear from the rest of you. Uh, thank you, Shireen. Our next speaker is going to be Rivka, who is an organizer and lawyer in Chicago. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me on this panel and thank you for the organizers for organizing this. It's good to be in conversation with you all. Um, and Ramadan Mubarak for all those observing. Uh, my name is Rivka. As he said, I'm a movement lawyer based in Chicago and I'm also an organizer. Um, Chicago has been going strong with our 28th protest yesterday 
And um, thankfully, it's always been a great turnout. And I'm glad to see that other cities are continuing placing this pressure on the streets um, and in other avenues such as direct action, civil disobedience, et cetera. Um, I want to echo what Shireen said, like we know that we're at a time of irreversible momentum and that this momentum needs to be sustained uh, because as we know, the ceasefire is the floor and liberation is the ceiling. Um, but today I'm going to be talking about uh, the ceasefire resolution that we had passed in Chicago and about the march on the DNC. And so um, the ceasefire resolution in Chicago was passed on January 31st to be specific. Um, but we were in, we weren't only in city hall on January 31st. Like there was a lot leading up to January 31st, um, to the ceasefire resolution. Uh, we were going to city hall to Chicago city hall since October fighting with our fighting with our elders. Um, because in October, specifically on October 9th, we found out that Deborah Silverstein, an elder of the 50th Ward in Chicago, was introducing a one-sided pro-Israeli resolution. This resolution was completely awful. It did not mention Palestinians whatsoever. It, um, it didn't contextualize anything. And it was we were just going into uh, take a public comments and explain why um, it's important to mention Palestinians in, in the resolution. And um, I'm not sure if people know this, but Chicago is home to the largest diaspora population of Palestinians in the U.S. And um, it's the second in the world after Chile. And so we found it important as Palestinians to be represented um, in uh, Chicago City Hall. And um, unfortunately, this pro-Israeli resolution in October ended up getting passed. But um, it was still important to set the record straight on where their constituents stand, even though the elders went against us at that time. Um, and there was a lot that affected people at this, uh, uh, from this hearing, for example, if you don't know Janan Shahada, she had her job revoked, um, rescinded from a top law firm in Chicago for something she said during public comments, um, in, in this. And so I would, I could send like more about this in the, in the chat, but anyway, so this was also around the time where Wadi Al-Fayyumi was brutally stabbed to death, um, in uh, Chicago on October 15th, to be exact. And so we really wanted to bring these issues to 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 let our elders show how Palestinians were really being affected. And so, um, but that was in October. Um, since October from January, we were going to Chicago City Hall. And um, after the pro-Israeli resolution was passed, we had our own elders put forth the ceasefire resolution, which was introduced in the Health and Human Relations Committee. It passed unanimously by the end of November. But of course, it had to be taken to the broader board um, of elders where they had to vote on it collectively. Um, and that's it wasn't until a month before it was going to be uh, voted on where we really um, ex uh, where we really increased the pressure. Um, progressive elders such as elders Laspada, Byron Lopez, Rosanna were really pushing forward for this resolution. Um, Chicago progressive staffers united and they were really pushing for it. Uh, Palestinian youth and Arab youth did an amazing job and allies, uh, for, uh, organizations like JVP, dissenters, Muslims for Just Futures, uh, USPCN, AMP were all like, it was like every leftist organization in Chicago were really all hands on deck is how I felt it was a month before leading up to the ceasefire resolution. We were doing call in power hours, making appointments with elders. Um, it got to the point where, you know, <laughs> organizers would call elders office to see if they could come in and they were like, oh my gosh, is this about the ceasefire resolution? Like we were being very, um, very uh, aggressive with it. And even a day before, again, all hands out were on deck. High schoolers from over 78 uh, Chicago public schools did a walkout and they blocked like uh, important streets and they actually did a sit in at City Hall. And so there were so many moving pieces, like everyone was doing what they can in their capacity to ensure that the ceasefire resolution was going to get passed. Um, and so coming to the day of the vote, like we mobilized as hard as we could. We packed City Hall. There were probably 500 to 1,000 people at City Hall from like 7 a.m. We had people lining up so that we could sign up for public comments and be allowed on the second floor chambers. Um, and we were there until like 3 p.m. Um, and so when it came to voting on the ceasefire resolution, um, you know, <laughs> one thing that happened was uh, there were elders giving like, you know, Zionist elders giving the same BS of like Hamas is killing babies, raping women. And so um, we were uh, there were some people who were kind of like, of course, you're, you're uncomfortable about 
them saying blatant lies and trying to support the trying to not support the ceasefire resolution and so some people in the second floor chambers were disrupting at times and so um it, it came to a point where uh mayor brendan johnson had to like va he vacated the second floor chambers and so he kicked us all out and so we had to go to the first floor and then um it, they were like, okay, we could have some people go to the third floor where it's just a gallery. And so it was at that point, we were again hearing the back and forth of different elders saying why, you know, Palestinians' lives shouldn't be killed, why, why they, or, and um, saying why Chicago, why does this matter to have a Chicago resolution? We, we, Zionist elders were saying we need to figure out things in our backyard. And it's just like, okay, but. In October, you literally voted for a pro-Israeli resolution. Like <laughs> it was like contradictions upon contradictions. And so it was kind of like it was a movie in that like it came to the point where 23 voted yay, elders voted yay, 23 voted nay. And then it Mayor Brandon Johnson literally had to break the tie. And um, yeah, it was just crazy because like, of course, he broke the tie and it was exciting and it was joyful. But like after that, it made me feel like like I was walking out of city hall, we were about to rally and take up the streets and march. And I'm just like, damn, like we're a ceasefire resolution. It was that like all this for a damn ceasefire resolution. Like this is again, the floor. And it made me think like, what if, what, how are, how would we able, how would we ever be able to introduce like a, and the siege on Gaza and the occupation and the settler colony of Israel. Like it was just like, it's, it's just, it was just insane. But, um, and like one thing, of course, that's notable is like throughout this whole like process, throughout this whole journey, it was just like um, the repression that we faced during the entire time. This was also at a time where a lot of black and brown issues were being um, introduced in City Hall. And so things like immigration or an arbitration resolution where they wanted to um, they wanted to uh, uh, vote on an arbitration resolution that would get uh, that would have police um privately um discuss like issues of police misconduct and so thankfully that didn't get passed but it was just like many different issues so there's a lot of BIPOC people who are taking space of city hall and so which made it made, made the whole uh situation over policed um and you know there was violating open meeting laws creating rules out of thin air Zionist lobbies were also trying to get elders to not vote on the bill or vote on the resolution sorry and J.B. Pritzker, the governor of Illinois himself, was calling elders and said after uh, Brandon Johnson voted for it, he called and said he was upset at how Brandon Johnson um, uh, 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 broke the tie. And so it was just that was like a lot of repression happened. And um, thankfully, of course, like in the end, it, it did gain like national and international press coverage because we are the largest to pass the ceasefire resolution. But um, that's just to put it all in perspective. Um, and I know many other various cities did also has, have been getting it passed. And so that's been good. But again, like Shireen says, like, it's, it's like all this pressure that we've been exerting and it's just hasn't, it feels like nothing has like moved. Um, but again, we still need to keep going. Um, and we need to keep going because, um, there's also a DNC that people are organizing here in Chicago for, um. Uh, there is a March on the DNC coalition. Um, I could send links in the chat for that. So right now, DNC organizers are fighting to get their permits. Their permits were denied because uh, there aren't enough police officers in Chicago to protect the convention and protest. So they wanted the uh, the coalition to move four miles away from the convention. And so it just doesn't make sense. They're all, they have a presser and a hearing on tomorrow, actually, if you would like to go um, to appeal uh to for a, uh, an appeal hearing and so if you'd like to go to that and support because um uh who's involved it's a bunch of chicago organizations uh uh like freedom road socialist organization uspcn and a lot of community organizations um and then also they've actually also increased the security budget to 75 million for the dnc uh this the original budget is usually 25 million and now it's spiked up to 75 million. So that's just extremely terrifying. Um, it goes to show how much, what to expect um, in August when uh, when the uh, DNC actually is. And so it's just like, we need to prepare in a way. Um, 
And of course, it's important to protest the DNC because not only to just shit on the Democratic Party, but also um, to to show like to bring Palestine on the table and to show like we're not stopping. Even if a ceasefire resolution gets or even if a ceasefire gets called tomorrow, it doesn't matter. The like uh, the stance on Palestine has been the same throughout every presidency, and we need to show this. And and um, it's important because you know we have this mindset or we've people a lot of people have the mindset of lesser of two evils etc cetera, etc cetera. but we know especially from the past few months that there's no such thing as lesser of two evils they are extremely equally evil um and um and it's just it's good to see that it's reflecting in the polls like according to Reuters, seven fifty eight percent of u.s americans disapprove of the president biden is losing so many supporters um especially with young voters. Um, and so there's like movements across US cities to vote on different things. I know in Chicago, we're voting Gaza, we're writing in Gaza for the presidency. In Wisconsin is uninstructed, in Michigan it's uncommitted. And so we're trying our best to mobilize um, in order to show like, if you want to forget our communities, we're going to go against, like we're, it's going to show and it's going to reflect. And so we need to band together and um, and support one another at this time. but. Yeah, um, I will send links for things that I've talked about, but yeah, that's kind of like what's been happening in Chicago and excited to hear from other panelists. Thank you, Rivka. Uh, it's always important to watch social movements in Chicago if you wanna know what's happening in this country. Um, our next speaker is Karina uh, from Labor for Palestine in New York City. Karina, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Rikva and uh, Shireen for, for those really um, informative and powerful presentations. Um, and thank you to the organizers for putting this together and um, for inviting me to participate today. Um, so, you know, as has already been discussed, we, we, we find ourselves in a moment here today um, that is, is in many ways fraught with despair, um, primarily marked, uh, you know, marked by the, the uh, ongoing genocide perpetrated against the Palestinian people, uh, which is a grim testament to over a century of imperialist fueled violence and 75 years of unrelenting settler colonialism backed, of course, um, financially, economically, militarily by the United States. Uh, however, um, amidst the horrors of this genocide, there a, a glimmer of hope, as also has been discussed, um, emerges um, from the resilient resistance, first and foremost, um, of the people of Gaza, who courageously stand against one of the most powerful settler colonial militaries in the world, bolstered uh, by uh, unwavering support from the world's most powerful military and imperialist power, the United States. The Palestinian defiance offers a beacon of possibility signaling that another world is possible beyond the confines of these systems and structures that have long oppressed, exploited, and dispossessed the masses across the globe. Um, another reason um, to be hopeful, as both Shirin and, and Rikfa uh, have discussed, despite uh, you know, the atrocities that we're facing with the genocide, is that we are more organized than ever um, here in the belly of the beast. There are more people involved um, with the protests, with direct actions, with student organizing, with labor organizing, um, more coalition building, more connecting the dots between the war abroad and the war at home, structural racism, capitalist austerity, gentrification, settler colonial dispossession here in Turtle Island, labor exploitation, heteropatriarchy, um, and um, the need for police and prison abolition um, here as well. Um, as Rikva said, um, uh, put it really uh, eloquently, more and more people are realizing that the ceasefire is the floor and liberation is the ceiling. And of course, radical solidarity has strong roots in all the major liberation struggles of the last several centuries, from the Haitian, Cuban, Soviet, and Chinese revolutions, and including all the anti-colonial struggles. In his seminal work towards the uh, African Revolution, Franz Fanon articulated the connections between our liberation struggles, not only in terms of shared conditions of colonial and imperialist domination and dispossession, but also strategically and tactically in terms of developing the tools 
and material capacity for liberation. In his text, he discussed the pivotal role of the Algerian anti-colonial struggle for the broader context of African liberation. And he argued that African unity is central, was central to the continent's liberation, underscoring this perspective with a powerful statement. Algeria, he said, the bridgehead of Western colonialism in Africa has fervently transformed into the hornet's nest in which French imperialism finds itself entangled. This assertion highlights the significance of the Algerian struggle as a linchpin for challenging and dismantling Western colonial dominance across the African continent. Similarly, Palestine today constitutes a flashpoint for our struggles. Um, I'm focusing here on labor organizing within the Palestine trade union movement, although I'd also be happy to talk about um, organizing within our universities and retaliation too. The, this moment of crisis not only unveils the stark contradictions inherent in colonial capitalism, but also underscores the urgent need to challenge systemic injustices while upholding principles of solidarity. L labor organizing serves as a microcosm of these contradictions with the dominant paradigm of what we've seen as the dominant paradigm of, of business unionism, prioritizing um, incremental gains for select segments of the labor force over systemic transformation. And this is not a new issue. This is something that goes back um, uh, over a century. Marx and Engels observed in 1892 that this approach um, uh, perpetuates divisions within the working class and obstructs meaningful solidarity efforts, hindering the prospects for revolutionary change. While business unionism, which is the, the main um, trend within unionism in the US, uh, US labor organizing may yield short-term benefits for certain privileged factions of the working class in the capitalist core, it has done so um, as you know, uh, scholars like W.E.B. Du Bois uh, have pointed out um, and others from the radical black tradition um, on the backs of super exploited black and brown workers in the global South, as well as here in the belly of the beast. Um, so I just want to say a few words about this dominant trend we can talk about as a form of labor imperialism um, or uh, labor uh, and connected to it um, labor Zionism, uh, which, you know, again, has privileged uh, focused on privileging a particular sector of, of uh, working class in the global north. Um, uh, in, in this case, in the context of the U.S. So la labor not, uh, Zionism, and it's done so by collaborating with U.S. imperialism and U.S. capitalism, therefore, um, as well as settler colonial um, dispossession and, and uh, Zionist capitalism in Israel. So labor Zionism historically ent uh, has en entwined with business unionism represents a, a manifestation of this compromised approach evidenced by its collaboration with institutions like the Histadrut um, to further the aims of settler colonialism in Palestine. The Histadrut masquerading as a trade union has in reality served as a vehicle for the super exploitation and dispossession of Palestinian workers, facilitating the colonization of Palestinian lands through a network of economic enterprises. From its inception, Histadrut played a pivotal role in the Zionist project, receiving substantial financial support from U.S. unions in the early to mid-20th century. The convergence of labor Zionism and U.S. imperialism extended beyond Palestine, with Histadrut's involvement in supplying weaponry to apartheid South Africa and cooperating with the CIA in various Global South interventions illustrating its complicity in broader systems of oppression and a reminder that Israel and its various organs is the spear of U.S. imperialism, often doing its dirty work in a way that provides plausible deniability to the U.S. government. Not only does the AFL-CIO leadership continue to maintain support for Zionist settler colonialism through its continued support for the Histadrut, and as well as investing millions in the Israeli government through the purchase of bonds without consultation with its members, it has consistently opposed also BDS, the BDS movement and has taken steps to prevent more radical locals from adopting or even discussing resolutions related to BDS or, Palest uh, or Palestinian rights. And I, I, you know, lots of examples I can go into, but I don't have much time. I just also want to give another recent example of labor gatekeeping um, in the treatment by the United Auto Workers Union uh, leadership of the uh, the UAW of the UAW Labor for Palestine uh, group, a grassroots work working group advocating for the union to endorse the Palestinian trade union call for BDS against Israel, demanding the termination of ties with the Histadrut, divestment from Israel bonds and industries linked to the occupation and an end to US aid to Israel. 
Uh, the UAW Labor for Palestine organized faced repression when they disrupted the January Community Action Program Conference in which the UAW International Executive Board endorsed Genocide Joe's but a, a campaign, a presidential campaign. The group called on the leadership to withhold endorsement of Biden's reelection campaign due to his support for the ongoing genocide, which they, in Gaza, which they correctly interpreted as crossing the Palestinian trade union picket line, undermining the solidarity that is at the heart of trade union organizing based on the idea that an injury to one is an injury to all. The UAW Labor for Palestine members were met with hostility and physical violence and were forcibly removed, violating the union's ceasefire call for Gaza and President Sean Fain's commitment, um, you know, important commitment to class struggle unionism. In juxtaposing the prevailing tradition of business unionism with the more radical approach of, of class struggle unionism, a stark dichotomy uh, emerges. Uh, business unionism rooted in the preservation of narrow material interests and complicit in perpetuating labor imperialism and Zionism stands in stark contract, contrast to the principles of radical, anti-racist, anti-colonial, and anti uh, imperialist trade unionism. And this tradition views the class struggle as intricately linked to the fight against capitalism, racism, and imperialism. And labor for Palestine draws on organizations such uh, that have perpetual, you know, who have uh, organized around this more radical tradition, the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, United Workers Caucus of the UAW, who organized the 1973 Wildcat strike um, to call for UAW to divest from Israeli bonds, and lots of other examples, the International Longshore and Warehouse Union. I'll just skip because I know I'm out of time to say um, Labor for Palestine um, draws this inspiration from and builds on the shoulders of this radical tradition. And since its ince inception in 2004, um, its founding principles uh, uh, call on U.S. trade unions to fully support Palestinian rights, demand an end for, to U.S. support for Israeli apartheid, divest from Israeli apartheid and affiliate with La Labor for Palestine. In response to the recent genocide, we issued a model resolution and statement aligned with the Palestinian Trade Union Federation's call, which Michael um, has posted in the chat. Uh, unlike many of the union ceasefire statements and resolutions coming out today, um, including the over 130 labor bodies that have signed the ceasefire resolution issued by the National Labor Network for Ceasefire, our model resolution rejects the false equivalents propagated by liberal ceasefire resolutions and unequivocally supports the Palestinian resistance. Um, and I'll just conclude by saying that it's really crucial um, that we um, uh, remember the words of the Union of Professors and Employees at Berzait University, who in their statement uh, um, in, in, in October called on workers across the globe to reject the criminalization of resistance, where all blood, this is a quote, that is shed is blamed on the oppressed and all crimes of settler colonial invasion and dispossession are ignored entirely. As we navigate our own struggles for justice, let us remain steadfast in our support for Palestinian liberation. The people of Gaza are being punished for resisting this brutal, the brutal violence and dispossession of settler colonialism and imperialism. We must continue to be resolute in our solidarity and stand with Palestinian people in their struggle for liberation because it's the right thing to do, but also because we know, as Fannie Lou Hamer put it, that none of us is free until all of us is free. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. Um, we know the labor movement is gonna be crucial if we're gonna develop the structural power we need to oppose Zionism effectively. Um, our last speaker before we go to discussion is gonna be Joshua from Students for Justice in Palestine uh, at Middlebury College. All right, hi everyone. I'm Joshua Glucksman, you can call me Josh. I'm a senior at Middlebury College. I'll Keep my remarks brief, not only because I'm the, the youngest and least experienced um, member of this panel, and I really have so much to learn from everyone, but also because I think the nature of college activism is one where we are always looking for more input than, um, you know, experience to give to others. And actually the insidious nature of college activism, specifically with SJP, is that we are only here for four years. And one of the th kind of meta reflections I wanted to give before explaining what some of the um, long term infrastructure we're trying to put in place here at Middlebury, but also in conversation with National SJP is that 
most administrators know we are only here for four years and they exploit that time and time again. As a matter of fact, we have kind of gotten on good terms with some administrators who have openly said they don't trust anything we say or do because they sincerely believe, and I think this this really speaks to the banality of evil, they don't even believe that what our movements stand for necessarily have a pulse that lasts more than four years. They don't want to act because they believe that the student sentiment might just change after four years. And in fact, all students leave after four years. So uh, continuity is, is of the utmost importance. And so with some of the actions that I'm about to outline, I think one thing we want to learn from, from more perennial movements, such as labor organizing, the teachers and professors and staff members on these campuses who are figures who stay for more than four years. These are the people that I think building coalition with is the most important to move forward. But I can say since October 7th, since the start of the genocide, which is obviously the continuation of over a hundred years of colonial violence, we have seen a large uptick in SJP presence. So again, to talk to the problems, just to be quite frank, of college activism, SJP has disbanded three times in the past decade since it's been on campus, right? It is a very real problem. Again, administrators know this and they uh, kind of poke at this because they know it to be true. But we basically rebounded and restarted in the fall, so just six weeks before October 7th as an organization. And we had no institutional memory. We had to scavenge through records. And so one of the earliest things I can say here is that keeping institutional memory is one of the most important things for college activism. The people who stay on campus are the professors. And if anyone here is a professor who is especially not tenured at a college, you will understand that getting publicly involved and being you know, a mentor, either explicitly or kind of under wraps is fraught for uh, in one's academic career for sure. So that's one thing to consider. But the other thing we really have emphasized is creating strong alumni networks. And this is something that National SJP really helped emphasize for us early on, the idea that we can keep institutional memory long after we leave this place, not only through um, we've created a signal group and we now have over 100 alumni who are actively working and organizing um, as Middlebury doesn't have a faculty for um, justice in Palestine yet, um, but we definitely have alumni who are actively sounding the call, just you know, trying to keep Palestinian alumni in contact. We've been able to do mutual aid for uh, Middlebury alumni who are from Gaza. And in addition to that, we are trying to create coalition with students here. One of the problems we've faced is that a lot of orgs rightfully so, are feeling the Zionist pressures of not wanting to partner with SJP. They hear the rhetoric, the demonizing um, of our organization that, you know, it's the Hamas arm on college campuses, for, for instance. So we have environmental groups, we have queer groups who don't want to partner with us because they're hearing that. And frankly, what else is there to combat that narrative? It's it's very strong. If they think they're going to lose their Zionist environmentalists and their um, uh, and queer Zionists, then frankly, if that's their concern, that's okay. If that's their the liberal theory of change, there's nothing we can do. But in terms of coalition building, the most important thing for us to keep in mind is that SJP gets so much stronger when we are with other voices because SJP alone is the demonized organization on most campuses. And so one of the earliest things we tried to do um, at um, my behest and with some other uh, radical Jews on campus was creating Jews for Ceasefire Now and trying to partner as much as possible to show um, that Palestinian organizing specifically through SJP is not anti-Semitic. I don't think it was enough because I don't know if anyone saw, I'd be happy to talk about this more in the Q and A uh, stand with us. A huge Zionist legal organization sued Middlebury less than a month ago um, for a bunch of allegations of anti-Semitism, uh, and this is not the first time that's happened, nor will it be the last. So that's kind of talking about coalition building. Some of the actual efforts we have done 
we're trying to do a boycott of the Starbucks on campus, a consumer boycott. We just passed it through the SGA unanimously, and it looks like we're going to be successful with that, which is surprising. It's obviously so small. It's just one Starbucks um, on one college campus. But the fact that it happened actually does seem like a huge paradigm shift for people really, you know, taking a deep breath and realizing, okay, are we going to get a ton of national pressure um, for this being one of the first institutions to do this? The context at Middlebury is that there was a large scandal in 2017 where a bunch of student activists shut down a um, a talk by Charles Murray. And so the Middlebury administration has been trying to uh, cool the temperature on student activism ever since then. And that's a problem we're going to have to face for years to come. So those are some of the things we're trying to think about in terms of long-term projects. But I think the last thing I can talk about, and I'd love to talk more in, in a Q&A format about this, is just the idea of pedagogy and academia in general. I think the funny thing is that one tool SJPs across the country have been using is the idea of free speech, which if anyone has ever read Marx, you'll obviously understand that the idea of having an equal amount of Zionist speakers and anti-Zionist speakers is no one's idea of, of liberation. But we can use that tool while understanding that there are basically no anti-Zionist speakers anyway. So this is kind of using um, this this more liberal bourgeois pedagogical frame of free speech. Middlebury actually ranks very low on that um, that right wing site fire um, their free speech index or whatever. So we have a long ways to go, I guess. But maybe it's because there are no anti Zionist speakers. I'm sure that's not their framework, but it's been ours and we've been successful. So we've held a teach in that was probably the largest um, activist uh, student led um, educational forum in a while. I would say they're. There were probably 250 to 300 students who came and we uh, gave critical perspectives on uh, on Gaza in context, you know, what happened before October 7th, which was important early on. And we're continuing to try and use this um, pedagogies of the oppressed to share within a liberal bourgeois academic sphere, critical and radical narratives surrounding Palestine, which has, has proved challenging for the one part, just because a lot of students have internalized the dangerous narrative that only people with PhDs are are qualified to talk. But I guess we can use that by inviting very radical professors, which we are trying to do. Um, so yeah, I can kind of close by saying our long-term vision is trying to maintain institutional memory at a very bourgeois institution. I think Middlebury, the last time it was ranked, has some of the most, I think, the most one percenters out of any student body. So it, in some ways, I know the, um, like the New York Times reading liberal imagination is obsessed with college campuses. They think, oh, this is really the pulse of, of America, which is so not true, especially for organizations like Middlebury. But I think we are trying to to subvert that and show that if we're able to push some of these students who are going to be the next heads of states and CA operatives and definitely, um, you know, Wall Street bankers and analysts, that's actually a huge role that we can use. We can flip on the head knowing that um, Middlebury is not the, um, the, or most colleges are not the reflection or a microcosm of America at large, but they actually are a reflection of the of the ruling class in many ways. And so if we can make victories there, that's important in a completely different right. So I'm excited for the, uh, the Q&A and thank you all for being here. Thanks, Josh. Um, Students for Justice in Palestine has been one of the most consistent organizations on the left in this country for some years now. So I think and students and young people in general are, you know, the the heart of of social movements. So thank you for for being here and, and speaking. Um, we're uh, my name is Alex uh, Schmaus. I'm a member of the Tempest Collective and the United Educators of San Francisco. Um, I'm chairing this meeting. We're going to be switching now to the discussion portion of this meeting, the open discussion. So the recording should 